No, it seems to work. But, uh, anyway. To the theor more, more the theoretical. A very brief introduction to the theory of For the two, two previous sections, uh, Fronter for the first lecture is also valid for uh, chapter two in uh, in uh, uh, the one that is on Fronter now is an older. papers that you're going to have uh, in this course. It will be put on Fronter. You don't have to pay for it, but you will of course have to pay if you in the usual way. It's now on Fronter and the new one that you will get are mostly identical. What is posted now you will not running the risk of having to do things twice there. We'll deal with <coughs> consumer and producer surplus. May have, uh, may have had uh, have so, we'll, so I'll go through that in the market when you open for trade finally transport costs in international trade it's not very difficult to follow I think uh, and uh, in a way that makes it possible So <coughs> we'll see, uh, try to address why countries trade, how it affects production and uh, affects the well-being in terms of surplus is uh, defined in a way fair between groups, which is a uh, many countries. This is the outset. <coughs> and supply curves. This is demand. You see that the first con richest consumer or the consumer that is most motorcycle is willing to pay three thousand six hundred dollars per unit this is the highest amount that someone is willing to pay and then as the price drops more and more motorcycles are sold locations here At a given price here of two thousand dollars, measuring or the market, amount sold is forty thousand, and this is the which is a nice straight line. something about the market type of, uh, of uh, commodity in the so this is kind of the market demand and you are not according to this able to sell 
more than perhaps one motorcycle at the price of 3,600. But you can sell 40,000 at the price of 2,000, and you can sell 65,000 at the price of 1,000. So it's a downward sloping curve. So, <coughs> um, so this is sort of that part of the story, and then you have the supply side of this. Meaning that the cheapest or, or the producer, the manufacturer that can offer this bike, offer a motorbike to the lowest costs of $400. So the first bike is offered to the market at $400. And as production capacity needs to be expanded, you have an upward sloping uh, supply curve. This curve is rather, sh it's quite sharply increasing. It could look like this, or it could be even sharper like this. That has to do with the elasticity of supply. And at the same time, the demand curve could also be more steep, or it could be flatter like this. That has to do with the elasticity of, of, of demand. In this case, <coughs> at the price of $2,000, according also to this supply curve, 40,000 bikes will be supplied to the market. In, case, in the case of a price equal to 2000 we have an area C. And that area is called the consumer surplus in this market. And what is that? That is the, the let's say, the, the willingness to pay that exceeds the price that is taken in the market. So you have a some people who are willing to pay more than 2,000. They are left with a surplus. If you get something on sale, a pair of nice shoes or a mobile phone uh, for half the price, you are left with a consumer surplus because you might have been willing to pay the full price. If you get for half price, that's nice. Then you have a surplus and you can spend your money on other things. And this is what is shown here. So C can be called uh, the consumer surplus with the price of 2000. Can be calculated easily here. And that is uh, equal to 3600 minus 2000. times 40 Is this correct? Yeah, that is exactly what I was after because you have this triangle. So you can calculate that. And you can also calculate consumer surplus if you reduce the price to 1,000. And you could think of the possibility that if you are able to sell those bikes at 1,000 instead of 2,000, you could do that if you start to import Japanese motorbikes into this American market. Prices could go down. Then the consumer surplus is equal to the area C plus T plus D. And then you can, uh, and then you can um, formulate it as C plus 2,000 minus 1,000 times 40,000, which is area T. 
plus d, which is um, then um, 2,000 minus 1,000 times 65,000 minus 40,000. And again, divided by 2. So if we get a change here that can reduce prices, we could then argue that the increased welfare from the consumer's point of view The increased consumer surplus is equal to the RST plus D, because we have C from, from before. That was already in place when you had the price equal to 2,000. OK. Um, <coughs> on the other hand, we see that if we reduce the price from 2,000 to 1,000, the, co the producers will there will be an impact of on the, on the on the producers here because in this case the areas above the supply curve is to produce a surplus it is simply their profit you can call it their profit so if they produce and sell for $1,000 per bike, and they produce 15000 to that price, the consumer surplus is equal to the area E. If they produce equal to, or if they can sell for 2000 they add W plus W areas to their producer surplus. And you can calculate that in the same way by using the, these formulas and, and, uh, and then see what is the change here in, pr in, consu in producer surplus worth in terms of money. 2,000 minus 1,000 times 15,000 plus 2,000 minus 1,000 times 40,000 minus 15,000 divided by 2. And then you get the, the picture. And here in, this, in, the, in these graphs, the, the areas may, may look similar in size. But if you do the calculations, you will see that it, it's not. It's, uh, you get different numbers, and you get a, a net, uh, you get a net uh, gain here because the benefits for the consumers, the increase in consumer surplus, is greater than the reduction in producer surplus. So this is the sort of, the very course of this theory is to, let's say, play with consumer surplus, producer surplus in various markets and see what, what happens. And we'll see now quite clearly what will take place here. I have just uh, put up this, which is basically what I've said now. Um, I have just le left some dotted lines, which you can fill in for yourself when you prepare this, uh, to, to do the calculations, like I have done on the blackboard here. Four change in consumer surplus and changes in producer surplus. Is this understandable so far? Okay. Then we can combine this. Uh, <coughs> we combine the demand curve and the supply curve and we get an equilibrium where the marginal or the willingness to pay for the last motorbike sold in market is equal to the marginal cost of producing the same bike, $2,000. And where these curves meet, you have a market equilibrium. 
40,000 bikes are sold in the domestic market for $2,000. This is, yeah, what kind of bike brands do you have in the US? Harley Davidson or whatever. This was in the situation in the 70s, before you had some trade liberalization going on. Because in the US, back some 20, 40 years, 50 perhaps, <coughs> you were not allowed to import the cheaper Japanese motorbikes. So they protected their home industry. So the gains from trade, which I'll show you, the other side of that coin is the costs of protectionism in international trade. So then we expand this a bit. And it's not as complex as this look like, looks like. <coughs> this is <coughs> the equilibrium that I just showed you. This is the American market with the demand and the supply curve, just identical to the previous panel with the equilibrium at $2,000, 40,000 bikes. <coughs> but we have another player in this market. The rest of the mot world's motorbike market. Uh, I happen to run, I happen, I am running too fast on my motorbike. So I am a bit interested in this market. So I, perhaps that is why I chose it. But uh, we can translate that to the Japanese market, which, is, which traditionally was a really low cost producer of, of good bikes. Anyway, this is the supply curve in the rest of the world's motorbike market with a market clearing price in the, in the domestic market in, for simplicity, we can call that the rest of the world, Japan, okay? So the market clearing price is 700, not 2000, but 700. And for that price, they sell 50,000 bikes in Japan. We see that the willingness to pay, the demand curve for bikes looks completely different. It's more elastic and it starts at, let's say, this is not uh, very good scaling, but say at some $1,300 per bike, as opposed to 3,600 in the US market. So the willingness to pay is lower the production the 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 production costs are also lower and then we can study a situation where we open for trade between these two economies so now the american consumers have access to much cheaper japanese bikes so what will take place here? The supply curve for the global, let's say the, the, the market for global trade or trade in this case between Japan and the US or for the rest of the world to the US starts at 700 because <coughs> this is the market clearing pri price in the domestic market. So up to 700, they sell everything domestically. But the remaining <coughs> part of the supply curve starts here and it goes upwards. The same at the same time, the demand curve for cheaper bikes starts at 2000. That because above 2000, they, they buy their, ba their uh, bikes 
at home where they are produced. Let's say they buy them Harley Davidson or whatever. But these consumers, they are not. They, they cannot afford the expensive Harley Davidsons, but they can. They can afford the cheaper Yamahas or Hondas or whatever from Japan. So the demand curve for the global globally traded products starts at 2000 and it goes downward. So <coughs> at some point you have an equilibrium here as well where the marginal willingness to pay for imported bikes intersects with the supply curve for the same bikes. And I have drawn that as this point here. This is where you have $1,000. And the production in Japan or in the rest of the world is then 75,000 bikes. So then you could ask, how could this be 50? Because the market for imports into the US is 50. But the extra production that you get out of an increase in prices from 700 to 1,000 is just 25, 75 minus 50,000. Does any of you s do any of you see the answer to that? Because what, what is happening in the low cost <coughs> market here is that when you increase the price to thousand, and especially when you have a such an elastic demand curve as this, you are actually actually so uh, twenty five thousand domestic consumers in this low cost market, they will not afford the bikes anymore. Because this will be the market price also in the exporting country, the low cost country. The prices will increase from 700 to 1000. And because of that increase, this area here will be the reduction in consumer surplus in the low cost country. And this amount, because of the elasticity of demand here, you will have 25,000 bikes less in demand from the low cost market itself. So 25 plus the 25 that you get in increased output is equal to 50, which is then exported into the US. So the consumers here, which is 1,000 minus 700 times 25, plus 1,000 minus 700 times 50 minus 25, which is 25 divided by 2, is the reduced consumer surplus in the low cost. Country. So the consumers in the exporting country will suffer because of the higher prices. And <laughs> as a result of that suffering, 25,000 bikes are made available, so to speak, for exports, in addition to the 25,000 that is the increased output because of the higher price. So here, you get a loss in the consumer surplus, but in addition, to that, you get an increase in the producer surplus. Because the producer surplus used to be this area, but now it is this area. Right, you see that? So they earn 1,000 minus 700 times 50 plus 1,000 minus 700 times 25 divided by 2. 
So the change in, cons in producer surplus in this exporting market is higher than the loss for the consumers. So we get a transfer of economic welfare where consumers are becoming worse off, whereas the producers are coming bet becoming better off. And now if you think about it, if you now think back to what I said in the first section, I said that some of the low-cost developing economies suffer from lack of a, uh, of a welfare policy that ensures that everybody gets their share of the economic welfare to reduce poverty. Here you get uh, those who own the factories, they will earn quite a lot from trade liberalization, whereas the, let's say, the poor, poor people will suffer, the consumers. But you can use <coughs> distributive policies, uh, you can use uh, transfers, uh, you can use education, you can transfer money to healthcare to make, to sort of make the producer surplus available also to, to, to the society at large. And that is what is not happening in, in some of these countries. The producer surplus is just kept by the producers, which are few and very rich. In many cases. So that is the situation for the exporting countries. In the, import, in the importing countries, in the US, because of this uh, opening of trade, prices drops from 2000 down to 1000. So, what will happen? This is the supply curve in the US. When the price drops, the production drops from 40 to 15,000. The producer surplus in the US is reduced from this big triangle and down to this small one. So we get a big, at least as this is drawn, I have drawn it like this to, to show you the, let's say, the strong effects. They may not be this strong in, in a normal situation with, uh, with opening for trade, but just to illustrate the principal points here, you get a reduction in produ producer surplus from this area down to this. So this is why, if you see in the political debate that someone is fighting for, for, uh, for their interests, you could just follow the money and you can get some answers. The American motorcycle industry, they fought strongly against opening for, for trade to, to be protected from a situation like this. And you see easily why they did so. On the other hand, <coughs> the consumers, the American consumers, they got an increase in consumer surplus from this area, which is equal to the area C that I calculated on the blackboard, and down to this area. So an increase from this triangle and up to this one, which is a substantial increase. And if you do the same co uh, comparison between consumer surplus and producer surplus, you see that in the importing country, the high cost country in this case, the consumers are the gainers and the producers are the losers. You get this? So the gains from trade in total 
is the differences between producer surplus and consumer surplus in each of the two markets. In the exporting low-cost country, the gains from trade is equal to this area, which is simply the difference between consumer and producer surplus. If you do the calculations, you see that rather easily. And here, in the importing country, the gain from trade is equal to this area, which is the difference between changes in consumers and producer surplus, as a which follows from this price decrease. So <coughs> those two areas added together in, in a market like this gives you actually the the welfare benefits from trade and in this case we talk about welfare as equal to economic surplus. As an economist we, we, we use welfare in a, in a many people think that our use of the word welfare is quite strange because we just talk about economic surpluses. Uh, in the more if you think more in terms of political science, welfare has to do with distribution of wealth and, uh, and uh, quality policies, as I, as I talked about. But as an economist, and, and the term economic welfare, in terms of that term, these two areas are, are the benefits from trade. And of course, there are challenges. Um, which could have consequences. Um, I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, in this region, as we, which we are located in now, they used to have a strong industry that produced various types of clothing, jackets and suits and uh, trousers and dresses and what have you. Um, the World Trade Organization, they made uh, a decision some decades back saying that clothing should be subjected to free trade. So China, Southern Europe, which was then the rest of the world, during a, I don't think it took more than, not more than a decade, let's say 10 years, most of the local clothing industry in this region was bankrupt. It was bankrupt. We are worried about uh, some of our local industry clusters which produces high cost and I would say high quality products for the oil and gas industry. Um, what will happen if global companies comes in, gets the knowledge from the local industry, takes the production back home perhaps to low-cost countries and produces the same equipment for a much lower price. What will happen with the Norwegian production of this high-cost equipment? We could see something like this. We are not sure yet because it's complex and we don't quite know how this will turn out, but um, there are some worries. You could also <coughs> use this scheme to analyze the costs of uh, or the risks also of boycotts, economic boycotts. You, you know what that is. When we had the apartheid regime in South Africa, trade were banned, was banned, so South Africa were was not able to buy raw materials from anyone else. So they had to build up their own industry. 
So they build up a huge steel industry to supply their factories with, uh, with, with steel. So they ended up in a situation like this. And uh, the steel industry did, did well and, uh, under the boycott. And a lot of producers got quite wealthy uh, from that. But when the apartheid regime fell in the beginning of the 90s, the boycott was lifted, which was nice, because then you got all the nice effects from trade liberalization and uh, the nice areas here turned out to be positive. I mean, international trade, uh, prices went down and uh, everything. But what happened <coughs> was that the domestic steel industry in South Africa suffered a lot and most of it went bust because of this. So a lot of, uh, a lot of problems in specific areas outside of uh, Johannesburg had really suffered from this thing here, where cost uh, prices went down, the domestic industry disappeared. And if you combine that with a not so well developed equity policy or equality policy within a country, you, you could get really nasty effects in terms of real welfare for, for, for people. I've been there and, uh, and uh, it was quite, quite obvious to see the effects of, let's say, having bo a boycott going on for years, uh, protection from trade, building up of high cost industries with very little competition. And then you lift the boycott uh, all the other steel producers can come in and sell their products for much lower price and then the domestic industry is then uh, suffering. So the rest of the slides are describing or telling you what I have tried to say now based on discussing this illustration. Who gains, who loses, what are the uh, consumer surplus effects, the producer surplus effects, the net effects from trade in the domestic market, in the, in the global market, the, the, the market for exports with a, uh, with a demand curve from this point and downwards shown here and the supply curve from this point and upwards, shown here, you get an equilibrium point with the price, which defines the price in the domestic market after trade is opened. And then you got all the effects that I've discussed here. This is without transportation. So you sort of assume that the movement of these goods are, are not um, there are no costs. That is, of course, unre unrealistic. So what I can do now is to show you what happens if you introduce transport. But I think I will save that for the next lecture. Because then things start to get a little bit messy. So. I think I'll stop and, uh, and leave that for the first 15 minutes of, of the next lecture. It's a hang hanger for that lecture. So thank you.